Hi, Jeremy. Hi. It's good to have you here today. Thank you. It's good to be here. And, and good to have everybody else with us today. And uh, I'm going to be talking to Jeremy Firth, who has um, really been uh, a great systems thinker. And he's come up with some ideas about the two great commandments and some other issues that I thought would be very interesting to share at this time. So um, I'm just going to hand the ball to you, Jeremy, and maybe you could give us a little background on yourself and then kind of talk through some of your ideas. Sure. Well, I first I want to thank you for having me. It's nice to have uh, someone who will listen to my uh, philosophical ramblings because my family kind of gets tired of it sometimes. <laughs> I, I have the same experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's nice to have a platform. But uh, that being said, um, I grew up Mormon and actually went on a Mormon. I was a Mormon missionary. Uh, for two years, I was in. I went to Toronto, Canada. Um, I currently live in Utah, and I've lived in Utah most of my life. But I'm no longer Mormon. Um, around the age of, well, kind of on my mission, and then kind of after my mission, started drifting away from the church. And then, I think I, I mentioned last time, I left my church, my job, and my first wife all in the same week. Uh, which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> keep two of the three in your life, or keep one of the three in your life at once. But but I got rid of everything. I I I, I dropped everything and basically started my life over again. Um, and like I said, I think I was around 24, 25 when that happened. Uh, I the the religion I was handed as a as a young man makes a lot of materialistic claims about truth. Um, you know, they say the Book of Mormon was a literal history of people who lived in North and South America uh, around the time of Christ and that they were descendants of, of uh, Jews in Jerusalem. And that's a pretty big claim. Um, they made a lot of other truth claims as well and, and basically said, you know, in their, in their Book of Mormon, it says there was no death before Adam. And they took that to be literally. So before Adam, there was nothing that died, which means the earth, it was a, the young earth creation kind of concept. Well, as I grew up and started going to school and reading more and being exposed to scientific thinking, a lot of those truth claims just didn't hold up for me. And for me, you know, they, they say the Book of Mormon is the foundation of their religion. And if it's that, well, they call it the keystone. It's the keystone of the religion. And if it doesn't hold up, then the religion isn't true. Well, they make all these truth claims that don't hold up. So I had to conclude it wasn't true. And it was a really rough time for me personally. I mean, like I said, I left everything. I left my job and my wife and, and the church and um, went through a lot of struggle after that. Uh, I, I, um, I flirted with Scientology, I flirted with Taoism, I flirted with Buddhism, I studied martial arts. Um, I was really, you know, looking around. The Matrix was like a life-changing movie for me. I saw it seven times when it was in the theater. And, uh, and then I've seen it multiple times since then. Um, it was mind-blowing because I was going through an identity crisis and that movie seemed to also be about identity crisis, you know. Um, interesting what happened to the writers and directors of that movie is that you know they went they were going through a gender change um, process and so they were having their own identity crisis you know and I, I seem to really relate to that at the time but anyway I then ran into Jordan Peterson um, he came up just in the YouTube YouTube algorithm one day talking about the free speech and that's one of my pet topics so I listened to him talking about it and was really interested in what he was saying. And then I saw him on Joe Rogan on the Rogan podcast, the first time he appeared. And that was three hours of having my mind blown. And then he started doing the biblical lectures and I was done. I mean, as far as like my materialistic worldview was just crumbling at the time and just, it couldn't hold up to, a lot of the things that he was saying and a lot of the respect that he was paying toward the Bible. 
And it was actually really exciting and really anxiety causing at the same time because I had so many preconceptions about religion and about Christianity in particular that I had fed myself when I was breaking away from it and that I had been exposed to through, you know, new atheism. I'd read, I've read Dickens or Dawkins. I've read Harris. I've read, um, uh, Hitchens, you know, and they all make very compelling arguments against, um, uh, Christianity and about, against religion in general. And it took some time to warm up to the idea and to start letting myself consider that, I might be wrong about atheism. And, and it ties back to kind of what, what I wanted to talk with you about. It does tie back to a conversation I had when I was a Mormon missionary, I was 20 years old. And um, it was a conversation about, we were talking about buildings and about skyscrapers in particular and pagodas. Um, and I'll use a pagoda as example, an example because it's actually a better illustration than a skyscraper. But my my friend, my, he was my a fellow missionary, and we were um, it was called companions. We were missionary companions at the time, which means we lived together and worked together basically twenty four seven. You have to be within, you have to be in very close proximity to someone for two years. Your whole mission, you're you're with somebody. And so anyway, we were, we had become friends um, and we were talking and he was saying, yeah, you know, this, uh, a skyscraper has to be a balance of structure and flexibility or else it will crumble. It's not just, it's made of concrete, but they put joints in there that allow it to move with the wind or with earthquakes. Otherwise it would, it would crumble. And, and not at the time, but since then I learned about pagodas, pagodas, you know, those are the the uh, the temples that are in Japan and in China, and they have they have one central tree that they would build the whole thing around. They would get one long tree, and then they would build each of the floors on top of each other, and between each floor they slide. The floors are not connected to each other; they just rest on each other, but they're tied to the tree. So I each floor is tied. <laughs> yeah, so each floor is tied to the tree, but can slide on each other. So you have structure, which interestingly enough for this conversation is vertical. And then you have flexibility, which is horizontal. And what that allows to happen is in an earthquake, you get the tree moving like this in response to the waves of the earthquake, and the floors can slide on each other. And that's why they've been able to stand up for hundreds of years in an earthquake and in a higher earthquake environment. Mm -hmm. They haven't been destroyed. So they are, you know, traditional mindset understood this traditional mindset understood the concept of structure and flexibility and how to, how those two work together and how to balance those two so that you have a building that will stand up for 900 years. Well, anyway, we back to the conversation of the skyscraper, my, when he said that, the structure and flexibility, I just had the closest experience to revelation that I've ever experienced. And I, I just blurted out, that's like pride. And that requires a little bit of unpacking because the Mormon concept of pride, the way they use it in their scripture and in their theology and in their doctrine, is that it's basically um, maybe not the opposite, but on an opposite pole from love. So pride and love are kind of the extremes of a of a uh, of a gradient. And so another way that they define pride is hatred, hostility, or opposition. All right. So it's H two O is how I remembered it hatred hostility opposition and and that's another word for that is that you see in scriptures is enmity and that's just a word we don't use much anymore but it it, it means hatred hostility or opposition so so when i said that's like pride what i was saying was structure and flexibility are like enmity 
and that ties to um oh i'm sorry i have to take i have to pause for just one second um i'm sure. getting a phone call from my wife so if we can okay. pause okay thank you one second sorry for the interruption um anyway you know, so you had just said that pride is the idea of hatred hostility or opposition or all three of those and another way to talk yes. about that is enmity yes correct and, and you made the gigantic leap that that somehow connected to structure and flexibility so i'm really eager to hear how that <laughs> together here we go so and it wasn't my leap this this i like i said this was handed to me in my mind and i could barely speak fast enough to keep up with what was coming through my mind and it was the idea that so the two great commandments according to jesus in the sermon on the mount are to love god and love your neighbor and if we consider that enmity would be not keeping those commandments so enmity toward god and enmity toward our fellow man would be a manifestation it's not fair to say the opposite but would it would be a falling away from those two great commandments right and and it's easiest for me if i think of this kind of as a as a something that holds us together and and if you're you're not in line with it you're falling away and or spiraling away turning away but anyway the idea the first idea is that if we have too much flexibility in our lives, we are prone to chaos. And I have ADHD, so I'm wired for chaos. It's, if you look at my background there, you can see, I, this is like me organized. <laughs> it's, it's very different than what most people's organization looks like. But to me, I know where everything is and it's fine. I'm a little wired for chaos. So, I'm drawn to these kinds of things in my life. I'm drawn to the passions. These are the sins of the passions, right? Where we're ruled by our bodies. We don't want to be ruled by God. We don't want to be ruled by structure or order. We want, you know, like when I was young, I feared ritual. I feared habit. I, I, I abhorred it. I didn't want to use a planner. I didn't want to use a schedule because I felt slave to it. I felt like I was um, locked in to a pattern that I couldn't break out of. And I was very anxious about that. And so I had too much flexibility in my life for much of my life. And that leads to, that's the enmity toward God, right? Which would be the falling away from the idea of love toward God. So I have too much flexibility, too much chaos in my life. And and because of that, you open yourself up to being overwhelmed by chaos. You fall into traps of your passions and, you know, I've lost money, I've lost relationships, I've lost family over having too much chaos in my life. Not enough order, not enough structure, not enough love for God. Well, and that's, nothing just jumps good. out at me that I'm going to throw in here. Sure. Probably kind of a controversial thing to say, but it jumped oh. out at me, so I'm going to throw it in there. Okay. When you made this, um, when you made the statement, you said too much flexibility opens us up to being overwhelmed by chaos, and I immediately saw the world with all of the open borders and the globalism had created too much flexibility and it completely opened us up to this chaos that we're in right now yes you now with this with this strange thing i i've just been rereading chapter four of um maps of meaning where he talks about the anomaly the mm. stranger or the strange idea or this, mm -hmm. this strange environmental disruption and those are all these anomalous events that lead to chaos. And yes. because we had too much flexibility in the system and we didn't have um, we didn't have any boundaries at all. You right. know, 
you don't want boundaries that are too hard, but you have to have boundaries that are at least fuzzy that can create connections, but still there have to be some sort of boundaries. And we had let loose of all the boundaries in this rampant globalism. Yes. That have opened us up to this chaos. So Yes. I agree yeah. with you completely. I agree that with that assessment of what happened. And and you know, I, it reminds me of one of my favorite poems, um, Mending Wall by Robert Frost. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's uh, we had to learn it when I was in in school. Oh, that's that's a that's a that's a great coincidence, um, a providential coincidence. Uh, it's the idea that you know they the, basically in the spring after the winter has done all of its work of frost heave and snow and and freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing has basically torn apart the stone fence and the neighbors start walking along the fence and any of the rocks that have fallen on their side they pick up and put together and they're kind of exchanging small talk and catching up over the winter i'm sure they haven't had much social interaction and at the end of the of the poem you know he said good fences make good neighbors and that is the concept that we've lost the good fences make good neighbors right the, mm -hmm. the boundaries it's a small stone fence. It's only, you know, in the story, they can see each other over the fence. It's, so it's only got to be three or four story, you know, three or four feet high. Uh, and, and, but it defines at the same time, it defines my property, your property. Mm -hmm. And without it, you lose identity. Without boundaries, you lose identity. And that's what we see as a country we've given up our boundaries and given up on the idea of borders. And at the same time, we lose our identity. And you hear this, my 13 year old daughter tells me this, you know, well, it doesn't mean anything to be an American. That doesn't mean anything. And it's like, she's being, she's hearing this. She's hearing this from YouTube videos and from other sources that, that, oh, being American doesn't mean anything. And yet it's the most unique country in the world that is unlike any other country because of its foundation and, and because of its structure. You well, know, you and its ability to adapt. It's got a balance yeah. of structure and flexibility that is more resilient than any other government system in existence right now. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. that's the theory. That's the theory. Right. Well, so far, it, it's it proven from... itself to be very resilient. Yeah. I mean, we lived through a civil war as a country. We lived through World War II as a country. And, and America still exists. Those are two very significant impacts to our culture that yes. haven't torn it apart yet. But I agree with you that I think chaos is the greater threat than structure right so now. So if we take it from this global structure all the way down in, in as fractals, because that's the way mm -hmm. the world is made up. Yes. Um, those boundaries are everything. I mean, I, I only exist because there's a skin on me. <laughs> yes. I only exist because there's a boundary on me that keeps me from being this or that keeps me from being another person. Yes. And, uh, and each one of my cells only exists because there's a boundary around that cell that keeps it from dissolving into the rest of my body. So, yes. so these boundaries yes, but go there's all the way fluid down, all the way up. fluid between those cells. Yes that allow them to rub against each other and interact with each other without becoming each other. That's right. And they and the cells have a permeability that allows resource to move in and out as it yes. needs to move in and out, right? So, yes, so we need correct. those permeable boundaries. But that's what that's what makes that's what makes things exist. Yes. And exactly. Uh, and I'm going to throw one more thing in here because I sure. want to, I want you to continue on, but I want to throw this other idea in that I heard Jonathan Peugeot say the other day that I thought was so great because I think it's going to fit in with what you're talking about and it might give us a little bit of a matrix to work with. Sure. He said, love is the balance of unity and multiplicity. Mm -hmm. And you can't have any identity without that. Yes. That's I agree where with identity that. comes from the balance of unity and multiplicity, which is a picture of love. Yes, it's a it's a it's what ties a story together, right? So 
so you're you're Karen, but you're also a mother, you're a wife, you're a sister, you're an aunt, you're a citizen of the United States, you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of California, you're a citizen of whatever city you live in. You're all of those things at the same time, but you're none of those things at any time, at any given time. You know, you are, you, so you have these layers that go in and out, and those layers are permeable, and you can jump layers any time, but no one of those layers define you, right? Because you could lose your sister or lose your uncle or lose your niece, and you would still be Karen. You could lose an arm, and you would still be Karen. Because there is a story, there's a logos that ties you together that is above all of those identities and unifies them. But you've got, it's the unity that brings together all of those multiplicities, right? You, even within your own mind, you have personalities that are competing. You have the personality that wants to eat food all the time. You want to have the personality that wants to sleep all the time. You have the personality that wants to paint all the time. And none of them get to win all the time. Yeah. <laughs> they take turns, you know, and, and that, but, but the way they take turns is defined by the logos. It's defined by the story that is Karen. Right. So that's kind of how I think about it is that it's that unification of the, the unity and this multiplicity. And that does tie into more of the structure and flexibility as well. Um, that, that I'll get into further, but yeah, you're, I, I totally agree with you. And that love is what unifies it because love is what keeps the story together. Right. What, part of what defines you as Karen is everyone's memory of you from interacting with you over time. And that their love is what keeps that memory alive and keeps your story somewhat unified, even though you're changing as a person, as you grow older. But then when you die, those who love you will keep your story alive by sharing stories about you to the ones they love. And, you know, I have stories that I heard from my great, great grandfather's life Wow. that I heard from my grandparents as they shared them with me. It's because I had the fortune of living with my grandparents for a year and learning more about my history and my ancestors. And, and that, that's part of the story that feeds into my story. I remember certain stories about certain attributes or certain personality characteristics of my ancestors that relate to me and how I live my life. And that, that is the, the story that keeps us alive and keeps us unified, right? It's like, it, it's the line of being a Firth. You know, I have ancestors five generations ago that I know about that did things that I could do, you know, that, that it would fit if you told the story and that, that I did it. And, and it's, it's my love for them that keeps that alive. It's my love that unifies that story and gives it life and keeps it moving. And those are stories that I've now shared with my daughter, you know, and, 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 and on a larger scale, that that's the same picture that we used to have as a nation where we had a love for our, our cultural and historic traditions as a nation that yes. held us together as multiplicity you know, we could still have democracy and everybody could have a vote and have a say and everything, but we were held together by some common ideals. And yes. that has begun to break apart. And just yes. the other day, I was trying to have this conversation with my daughter because she showed me this absolutely hilarious clip from Monty Python, where these peasants are out in the field working and the king comes along. Yeah. And he's asking them some questions and they, they're like, why should we bother with you? And he says, well, I'm the king. Well, who made you king? You know? Right. And, uh, right. and he. I'll see the violence inherent in the system. I, <laughs> yes. Yes. That's the one. I remember and, the clip. Yeah. yeah. And then he begins to quote how the lady of the lake gave him the sword, which is a beautiful story from the British tradition that led to you know the battle of hastings and and the magna carta and all of those things that laid the foundation for western civilization but he tells that story and in the context of that clip it sounds absolutely ludicrous 
and yeah. stupid and foolish. And in that one instant, that subversively destroyed the entire foundation of the British Empire. Yes. Which lost us Western civilization. Yes. It, this, that, that snarky, sarcastic, I mean, I bought into, I laughed. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah. But, yeah. but at the same time, you have to realize the subversive element in there that's just taking out our foundations. Right. We're it's undermining the, the hierarchy. Undermi yeah, it is. It's undermining the story. Right. You know, and we're seeing the same thing with the virus. That's what it's, it's doing to us as a culture is it's, you know, I mean, the whole phrase social distance, right? That's like the opposite of unification. It's so I, what keeps coming to mind is the phrase that's on our money, the Latin phrase that nobody talks about anymore. E pluribus unum mm -hmm. out of many one. Right. That that was the original motto of the United States out of many one. So it was we acknowledge that we're all different. We acknowledge that we are s separate and that we but but at the same time, we all have universal divine rights. And that is a that was a revolutionary concept that the idea of a universal human right didn't exist before. Well, exists because of Christianity. Um, Tom, what's his last name? Holland, oh, Holland makes the case for that. That, that the, the idea of a universal human right is revolutionary. And now we just take all that for granted. We're living on the carcass of the body that was created by Christianity and later by the founding fathers. And, and hopefully we can keep it alive for another generation. You know, but this is a big test uh, because our identity is being challenged and because distancing and multiplicity and flattening is all being imposed on, on this structure right now. Flattening of everyone into the same, there's, the boss is no better than, you know, your, your, your boss is no better than you and your employer is no more important than you are and I have rights too and workers' rights should be more important and, the, you know, whatever, whatever category you want to put it in, all of these things are trying to flatten the hierarchy, make us all the same and take away our identity. So on we're the, interchangeable. On, but on, the, on the positive side, one of the things I see happening though is at least amongst the people I've been talking to is a great appreciation for the heroes, the delivery men, the, mm -hmm. the garbage men, the, yeah, the builders, the, the repairers, the mm -hmm. grocery stock boys, the healthcare workers, all the people that are keeping things running, just yes. they're heroes every day. They're going out there and conquering. Well, and that we lost touch with that. We lost touch with the miracle of a modern functioning society. It is a miracle and magic, and it's unbelievable how effective and efficient it is at working well when it's working, you know? I mean, we turn on the lights and the lights come on. We open the faucet and water comes out. We put the trash out on the street on Wednesday mornings and within two hours, it's gone. This is magic. There's the only, that's the only word for it. It's a miracle. And everyone was taking it for granted because we've been complacent for so long. We didn't, you know, my grandparents didn't take it for granted because they grew up in the depression and went through World War II and the Korean War where there was deprivation and struggle and starvation. We've been complacent and this is, it is, I agree, serving as a wake up call. Hopefully we, hopefully we as a culture and as a society wake up to the delicacy of the balance between structure and flexibility, you know, and the need for boundaries at the same time that we have, you know, we have social interaction. You and I are talking, but we're, 500 miles apart, right? So that's, that's not a bad thing. It's okay to have an exchange. It's okay to have let things through the wall, but you should have gates so that you can control what comes through the wall, right? That's the way the cell works in our body. It doesn't just, it's not an imperv it's not a permeable wall to anything. It's got gates that let certain things through and block certain things. Mm -hmm. so, he, there was an analogy that, that I, that I kind of stumbled into. I think it was Jordan Peterson that said it. 
And he said, not everyone who's swimming toward the life, well, let's put it this way. There are those who are swimming toward the life raft of America with a knife in their teeth, right? So just because you need help doesn't mean you have pure intent. There's still a naivete that we've had toward globalism for some time that I think people are finally waking up to. People are waking up to the fact that not everyone who comes here shares our values and shares our ideals and wants to be a part of the vision. Some of them are coming here to undermine it. Mm -hmm. And some of them are coming here with a knife to take the life raft, you know, and, and we have to guard against that. What a picture. Yeah. That's, that's brutal. Yeah. Well, well you, so let, you have to be awake to that. Yeah. So let's go back to your comment then. You said too much flexibility mm. is equivalent to enmity towards God and that that's, yes. uh, that leads us to be open to being overwhelmed by chaos. So you were, yes. you were making the argument about too much flexibility versus too much structure. Ah, okay. So now we come to the more subtle and more pernicious, and I would say more, much more um, insidious falling away from love God and love your neighbor. And that is when we have too much structure in our lives. We can't adapt to the moment. And when our principles become dogma and laws become rules and ethics become morals, And what I'm saying is when, when rules come from being implicit to explicit, when principles are no longer principles, they're not governing principles, but when they become explicit, uh, explicit prohibitions or exhortations, that's when we fall into the danger of having too much structure. And, and Jesus, Jesus ripped on this all through the Gospels, where you know he was walking with the field, through the field, and some of his disciples were taking, it was on the Sabbath, and they were taking um, berries from the grasses and eating them. And the Pharisees saw it and said, How, what, what are you doing? What, what, you're, eating, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're harvesting. And Jesus is like, you're so worried about these tiny details, and you're missing the big picture. You know, you're missing love, justice, and truth. And you're obsessed with whether we're picking these wheat berries on the Sabbath. It's, and and that's what his, that's what his beef with the Pharisees was, is that they were obsessed with the details and particulars of the law without understanding the law at all. They had completely lost the meaning of the law and were obsessed with the mere appearance of the law. And this is, to me, what you see when there's too much structure. And, and the way it manifests is enmity toward our fellow man, right? So the whole purpose of structure and rules is to reduce complexity because we're all encountering complexity. And it's nice to have rules of thumb to govern us. And we can't deal with all the particulars. There's just too many. There's too many facts. So we... We come up with these governing principles, but then if we codify them and they become rigid, they become rules. And I saw this on my mission all the time when I was a missionary. Sometimes you have rules. Um, sometimes you have rules that are, uh, I'm getting a call from my boss. I got to take that really quick. I'm okay, sorry. no problem. One second. So, when our rules become rigid and oh yeah i was just going to say I, I i saw this when i was a missionary all the time where um you have two rules that are contradictory in a certain situation okay so we have this uh this family it's a young family they're um we're teaching them the gospel and they invite us to dinner and um it's and our dinners were only supposed to last one hour, but after dinner, these people are very interested in what we're saying, and they want to hear more, and they want us to teach them. So, do we follow the rule of dinner only lasts one hour, or 
do we adapt to the moment and teach this family? You know, um, there's just, there were contradictions like that all the time. Okay, so there was another one where we got a phone call from a guy who said, I'd like to, I'd like you, I'd like a, a Book of Mormon. I'd like you to bring over a Book of Mormon. So it was the, when the TV commercials were on for the Mormons. You could get your free copy of the Book of Mormon. He called, he wanted a Book of Mormon. So the missionaries are the ones who deliver those. Excuse me. We get to his house. He's got a drum set in his living room in an apartment building, you know? <laughs> I go, wow, this is cool, man. So I, I play harmonica and I just start talking to him about the drums and he's in a band and it comes out that there's a jam every week at this restaurant that's kind of a bar restaurant. It's like a bar grill. Um, and his band jams there and it's a blues jam. And do you want, if you want to bring your harmonicas, you're welcome to. Okay, so it's on a Sunday. The, the Mormons are pretty like, they have pretty strict or had when I was young, pretty strict rules about what was acceptable on Sabbath, what was not. Also, I'm a missionary and now I'm going into a bar slash restaurant. It's not strictly a bar, but it's a restaurant that serves alcohol. So now I'm on another gray area for Mormons because Mormons are very anti-alcohol. Third of all, I'm a missionary and now I'm going to play blues music. Okay, so that's not exactly sacred music. So now we're on very gray territory and for most people is very clear. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's my boss again. I have to take it. I'm sorry. So we have all these red flags popping up in the minds of most young missionaries, but me, I being a little more prone to chaos kind of felt more, well, I, I justified it in saying, here's an opportunity to go to someone else's turf where they're comfortable and share who we are with them and give them the chance to approach us if they're interested, right? Instead of us knocking on your door. And my companion at the time was pretty flexible. And so he's like, yeah, let's give it a shot. So I took my harmonicas down and we went to this restaurant and we were there for an hour and I met the drummer and then he said, yeah, come on up. Let's all, let's come on stage. And uh, oh my God, that's my boss again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to do you want to do it like in an hour? Do you have time? I can call you back in an hour. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Then okay. we won't be interrupted. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, Karen. So I was talking about the the um, the musician that we that asked for a Book of Mormon and ended up we ended up it ended up where I'm playing a harmonica in a bar on a Sunday as a missionary. <laughs> wearing my missionary attire. So I have my, my shirt and tie and I have a name tag. Uh, and what happened was a lot of people were intrigued because we were out of place, obviously. We were, it was weird. And um, so people started coming up to us and approaching us and asking us questions. And we ended up with a whole table full of people who were asking about Mormonism in the church and, and ended up baptizing several people who we met at that event and I shared with my mission president afterwards how we met these people <laughs> and it, it kind of I was thinking about this while we were taking a break it kind of stunned him into silence for two reasons one he couldn't exactly censure me because the outcome was positive but he couldn't encourage me because the rules were not followed and so, you know, you know, on a superficial level. And so he was really just kind of pushed into silence where he couldn't really respond to me either way because both responses would be inappropriate on some level. And that to me was a sign that I was living that balance between structure and flexibility really well. Because if the hierarchy doesn't know how to respond to you, that means that you're you're writing that balance really well between structure and flexibility right if the if your if your behavior is predictable that means it's probably being it's you're following some structure rules that might be too predictable and you might be falling into that that trap and and the 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 other point i wanted to rein that i wanted to kind of tie in 
was the idea that if you have too much structure, what it leads to is enmity toward your fellow man. Because your fellow man is the source of chaos in your life. It is the source of unpredictability when people are doing things that are anomalous or unexpected. And it makes you, it can make you uncomfortable. It can make you upset at first. And your response to that is how you pull yourself back into balancing between structure and flexibility. You have to have some tolerance for the fact that people are going to do unpredictable things. They're going to say things that make you upset or uncomfortable at times. It doesn't mean they don't love you. Sometimes they're saying something uncomfortable to you because they love you. And it can be uncomfortable to hear those things, but we have to stay we have to stay flexible, we have to stay tolerant to a certain level of discomfort in our interactions with people because people are inherently unpredictable. And that's the tie into a balance of structure and flexibility. And, and that really comes down to living a principle-based life rather than a rule-based life. And living not for the moment, but in the moment. Right. So you can live if you live for the moment, it's like throwing caution to the wind and you're but living in the moment means paying attention to your surroundings and responding appropriately. You know, they, they kind of talk about that in meditation a lot, where the whole purpose of meditation is to give you space between your instinctual response and your external response you know, your internal and external. It's like meditation gives you a, a space there. And the more you meditate, the longer that space gets before you respond to someone, you know? And, I, and I, to me, that's like really finding the balance between structure and flexibility, where I have the time to think about how I want to respond to somebody because I'm not responding immediately through my gut instinct. You know, it's like a, I have principles that are guiding my behavior, but I'm still able to respond because I'm, I'm listening to the person who's with me and what they're saying instead of just responding to a caricature that I've created in my mind through having too much structure, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it's one of those things that starts applying in many places. You know, it's a, it is a fractal concept, you know, I mean, it's a, if you look at a tree, a tree is a, a great balance of structure and flexibility, right? It's got the structure of the roots. It's got the structure of the trunk and the branches but yet it has the leaves that allow it to move in the wind and the wind can move. Now, if you have a, a tree that doesn't have enough structure, it can be blown over by the wind or it can be broken in half by the wind. If it has too much structure, same problem. Too much structure can lead to it just blowing over in the wind. It can't respond to its current environment, right? Or, or it will, you know, it, so, a tree is a really beautiful example of a balance between structure and flexibility. Um, well, I was thinking about what you said just before that, where you were saying when you attend to the person rather than to the image that you've constructed in your mind based on, on too much structure, or, you know, too rigid as an image that you have of the person, rather than that, you're, you're attending in the moment to the real human being that you're with. Yes. And I was thinking about years ago, I used to teach art at my daughter's elementary school. And the kids have such a hard time drawing something that's common because they have, a, they have an imagination of what that thing is. If they're drawing a shoe, mm -hmm. they have a picture in their mind of what a shoe is. But if you put a shoe in front of them and they're supposed to draw that actual shoe, it always ends up looking like a cartoon picture of the shoe because they're not drawing what they're looking at. They're drawing the picture that they have in their mind. Yeah. Kids are natural Platonists, right? So, <laughs> <with art. laughs> well, we all are really. I mean, yes, adults yes. do that too. So, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> so the way that you help them get beyond that is you have them do what's called contour drawing where they, they, they don't lift their pencil off the paper and they don't mm. look at the paper. They just look at the object very, very mm. carefully. And as they observe the object carefully, then they, then they just draw the outer limits of the object. So mm. even if it's in three-fourths perspective or if it's upside down or whatever, you just draw the outer limits of the object. And then once you get the outer limits drawn, 
then you can look at what you have and then you can start drawing the internal lines and you'll come up with something that's way closer to the reality than mm. just the cartoon thing that's in your mind. Yeah. And yeah. very, very effective, even with very young children. I could put, I could have them bring in their stuffed animals and they could put their little stuffed animal in front of them. And if they drew it without the contour drawing, it would just be a cartoon picture of a teddy bear. But yeah. if they're actually looking at the teddy bear, then they're drawing something that looks very, very like the thing that's sitting in front of them. Mm. And um, that made me think also about this idea of love. And I was listening to a discussion the other day, and I think this comes up in a lot of places that that um, if you don't love a thing, it's virtually impossible to truly understand it. Yes. And so knowledge, real knowledge starts with the loving gaze. Mm. Taking the time to really look at something and, and or really look at a person and really understand who they are or really understand what the thing is. And scientists that are very successful at you know, finding new paradigms and new innovations and so forth, it's because they really love what they're looking at. So they, they, look, they look long <laughs> at yes. what, you know, what is important to them. And they look at what it is rather than what they want it to be. Yes, yes. Right, yeah. And, and you know, that ties into the conversation I had with Paul Vanderclay about knowing and the biblical concept of knowing. Knowing was like sexual union with something, was mm -hmm. knowing. Like you couldn't know it unless you had sexual union with it. That's what knowing meant. Right. And, and I think that ties into what you're saying, where those are intertwined. Loving something and knowing something are uh, dance partners. You know, they have to be. Uh, I agree with that totally. And, and, and loving God and loving your fellow man, your fellow neighbor, is, is the idea of intertwining yourself with reality while maintaining your identity you know and and you can't lose yourself to you can't completely surrender yourself to your environment but at the same time you have to be intertwined with your environment to interact with it effectively and i and i think that's that feels like kind of what we're talking about and, and the other thing i wanted to tie in with pajot that something he was talking about was the idea of the cross where you have the cross that's a vertical and that would represent the love of God, you know, aligning things vertically and the horizontal, which is the human component of gathering in. So you have unifying and gathering together. And those are the two great commandments are illustrated by the cross. You know, you have the vertical component of, love God, the horizontal component of love your fellow man. And, and it, it aligns, you know, even the body is that way, the head, and the head down to the feet aligns vertically. And then you have your arms open as to the expanse, right? To the, the potential and your body's keeping you aligned and your arms are opening up to the possibilities, right? It's a, it's a, it's what Jordan Peterson talks about when he says, you know, you should have one foot in the known, one foot in the unknown. And that's where we're most effective as humans. You know, it's, it's completely uncomfortable. It's always, it's like you're constantly slightly off balance. That's the perfect place to be. That's like the flow state where you are open to the moment and time loses its meaning. Well, I, that's probably why they always say that all the opportunities are in the crisis, right? <laughs> Yes, and right, exactly. It is that all, all new information is in the unknown or in the chaos. Well, the dragon so, hoards gold, right? Yeah, yeah. The dragon hoards gold. So that dragon is protecting the treasure. So you have to fight through the dragon to get to the treasure you know, or to so the I maiden. Was, I was so. thinking back to when you were talking about the, the law and the principles, principles versus rules. 
Mm, yeah. And I was thinking about how um, in, I think, believe it's Psalm 119. Is that the, the long one that talks about the law? I think that's the long one that talks about. I don't law. know. You're testing uh, the, I'm not as familiar with Psalms, unfortunately. I had well, to let the there's out. a very 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 long psalm that talks about the love loving loving the lord's law loving the law oh. loving the word loving the law yes and uh, many many different times it talks about loving the law and yes just today for the first time i thought hmm, maybe it's impossible to really understand the law unless you love it Maybe it's yes. impossible to really understand God's word unless you love the word so that you're, you're taking it in the way you would take in a relationship or taking it in the way you would take in a favorite food or something. You know, it has mm. to be, but especially the law, because for, for us to understand these very implicit principles that are deeply embedded in God's law is kind of beyond our intellectual capacity. Yes. But, but when we love the law and seek to understand it that way, then, then it sort of becomes embedded in us and then it can be lived out and acted and it becomes more of a principle of our lives than it does some rule that we're following. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's kind of what happened with me with the two great commandments is that, you know, I was handed this when I was 20 years old, this concept of balancing structure and flexibility. And I saw it everywhere, even in my deepest, like atheist times. This was the unifying kind of philosophy of my life was that we should be balancing structure and flexibility. And, you know, I, I used the example of like, the first time I ever swam in the ocean, I was 18 and I was, I went body surfing and I had never swam in the ocean before. You know, I had swam in ponds and creeks when I was a kid. Cause we lived in, you know, I lived in the mountains and, um, and when I, the wave washed over me and crashed on me, I panicked and I was flailing and I couldn't tell which way was up and I'm inhaling water. And, and then, you know, the water washed away from me and I thought, well, okay, I got to try that again, but I'm going to try just <laughs> relaxing this time. Yeah. Well, I did, I'm <laughs> kind of stubborn. Yeah. So I thought, I, well, I'm not going to, you know, a, you that's get, a man's, that's a man's, that's a man's mind. That's yeah. If you get, a, if you get knocked off the horse, you know, I grew up on a farm. So if you get knocked off the horse, the first thing you do is get back on the horse. So I was like, okay, well the ocean's not going to win. So I'm going to try this again. So I go back out and I, I, I start paddling with the wave and, and I feel the same crushing motion and I just relaxed and went limp and I was turning and tossing in the water, but I had held my breath cause I knew what was coming. And then I ended up like on my hands and knees and the water just kind of washed away and you know, gravity took back over and that's always served as like the undergirding principle of my life to not the chaos is going to happen but you have to open up prepare yourself by taking a breath but then just relax and let let the water wash and then gravity's going to take back over and everything's going to realign and the chaos will subside if you relax and let it carry you where it's going to carry you you know and it doesn't mean that you're completely surrendering and not failing at all i still i held my breath and i i relaxed and i kept looking up to see where light was and so i'm paying attention but but i'm not panicking and i think right now as people are uncertain and a lot of things are up in the air there's going to be good things and bad things that come from this there's going to be you know some of the weak things that have been happening in our society are going to get washed away they're going to get destroyed you know new things are going to take their place. Like our company infrastructure is more robust now because people can work from home and people, you know, we have more, a little more flexibility with maybe some of the daily routines that we had before. But at the same time, we also see the connection. We need to see the need for human connection 
and how important it is to us and how lonely we are at this time. And so now people are going to cherish those relationships more. We're going to have positive and negative things that come out of this. People are going to be more fearful of the unknown, but at the same time, more grateful for the known. And, and I think we can take solace in that. We can find peace in that response to these times and try to be rational, try to make the best decisions we can with the information we have, try to protect our families, but at the same time, not get paralyzed into fear to where our social structures completely disintegrate. Because that would be the greatest strategy that could happen from all of this, is that the physical virus doesn't have the intended effect, but the response to the virus has the effect of disintegrating the body. That would be tragic. You know, we should have some kind of immune system as a society for these kinds of situations. And hopefully this just makes our immune system stronger and hopefully it doesn't destroy the body. But we'll see, it's unpredictable. It's a complex system, <laughs> so. Well, I, when, when you were talking about the waves crashing over you, I was reminded of one of my life verses, which is Jeremiah 5.22. And it actually shows up, I think, five other places in scripture, the same exact idea. And uh, it, it, this is more or less what it says. You, O Lord, have made the sand a boundary for the sea. Mm. And though the waves may crash and they may roll, they cannot overtake you. Mm. And um, that's that was beautiful. a very important verse to me at a time in my life when everything around me was chaos because a whole lot of things had fallen apart at one time. My husband yeah. had left me. My mother was um, three to four weeks from certain death because of a cancer surgery that had been unsuccessful. And my father was dying of heart failure at the same time. And, um, and so all of those things happened my divorce, my mother and father dying all happened within a four week period. <clears throat> oh, wow. And that verse um, was a lifeline and it was a promise. And ever since then, whenever I'm on a beach, I spend a lot of time contemplating the sand. Mm. The sand is a very important image for many, many, many reasons, you know, the unity and the multiplicity and, uh, yeah. and the number of grains of sand on the sea according to god tell us how many stars there are in the universe and yeah nobody ever would have guessed that yeah five thousand years ago right right um but the sand is is so passive on the shore it's such a passive boundary so it lets the water lap up you know the water is always lapping up on the sand yes. and then as the water pulls away, it sort of percolates down through these little holes down into the, you know, so it's a very permeable kind of a barrier. Yes. But, uh, but even when there's torrential tsunamis and storms and everything else, the waves may come in, but they're always going to go out. <laughs> yeah. And well, and try punching the sand. Miraculous thing, really. <laughs> yeah, try punching the sand. Then you find out that it's not so soft. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's it is magical that way. It's it's um it, and it serves as a nice border between water and rock. Mm -hmm. It's like a it's that border area where things are not defined. It sometimes acts like water and sometimes acts like a rock. It acts like water when it's when the water is when it's filled with water and when it's mixed with water. And at the same time it acts like a rock if you punch it. You know, and so it can it can be both it's that nice it's a nice explanation of a border you know where i read this book by a guy he wasn't the author wasn't this guy but the book was about a guy who's a, a drug enforcement officer but he works at very high levels of the drug hierarchy so he works with the the top dogs of the cartel trying to bring them down and he basically said you know by the time they get arrested from my work you know, it was a year or two before, or a year or two after what I did, you know, a year or two after I gathered the evidence so that no one can connect me to what happened. But he basically was talking and exploring the idea of how, at that level, the line between law enforcement and drug 
cartel drug lord is very gray and permeable and not well defined. Uh, the the mindset that leads one to be a good law enforcement officer is one that can think like a criminal, right? And you start getting into this weird murky area on those borders where it's not clear who the good guy is all the time because sometimes the good guys have to do bad things and sometimes the bad guys do good things. And it's not, it's not so black and white. It's not, it's not a morality play like an old cowboy movie. You know, it's, it's a, it's those borders are required and necessary. We need those fringes because they, they help define the body. You know, I, I, I'm still struck by the idea of like traditional rugs for thousands of years. You have these patterns that were meant to ward off evil spirits and to catch evil spirits. And at the same time, those rugs have a fringe which is where the evil spirits get re-released. And, and it's the fringe where, the fringe is where um, it's, it's not complete. And it's an acknowledgement that you can't try to have a complete system. You need those borders, you need those fringes, you need the edges that allows the rug itself to exist, right? You, you have to have those fringes that, you know, the gargoyles on the church are the same symbolism right? Where mm -hmm. it's these monsters that are not well-defined, that don't fit categories, that are on the border, that protect the church itself, right? And, and they help define the church by giving you something that's different, something that's not quite, you know, there's, there's is and there's is not, and then there's this area between that's not quite, not quite is, not quite not. And that's a really important area and a con an important concept. And I think when you start thinking about and you know as i've meditated about the structure and flexibility idea i find myself you know more toward the border than the center because i feel comfortable there i feel comfortable in the chaos i feel comfortable in the unpredictable um just and i think it's a wiring issue i don't think it's a i, I think it's just a personality issue you know it's just a it's an, an innate trait um, you know, and, and luckily we have people who are comfortable there. You know, we have special forces. We have people in the, you know, you have, even within the military, you have the structure and then you have the border and the fringes, which is the special forces, right? Even that's like a microcosm. And then, and that's on the border of the citizen, the citizens, you know? So we have these layers, even, even, you know, the, even within our society that kind of illustrate that, that concept. And then in the church, the same thing where you have gargoyles and narthex, and then you have the, you have the chapel, and then you have the, the, the altar, you know? Well, I've long contemplated what an amazing thing it is that in the entire world with all the billions of people there are, that, that there are people that are willing able to do all of the various kinds of work that has to be done to keep a society operating. Yeah. Which means that there have to be people with lots of different wirings. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. But, but the yes. wirings, all the different wirings that are out there seem to be perfectly aligned with the need. <laughs> you know, right. like, like in every, That's community, the... there's people who are, who drive the garbage trucks and there's people who restock the stores and there's people who, who uh, do the internet technology and and there's people who sew the clothing and there's people who grow the food and and there's and people have these passions or or it, it, if they don't have a passion they at least have a willingness yes. and a capacity to do certain things and some people have different capacities and it's just like you know in the bible when it talks about the body and all the different parts of the body and how each part of the body has a has a purpose and has a skill and has a designation. Yes. And, and then the, the whole earth works like that. And yeah. when you're talking about the margins, the, the thing that popped into my mind is that old saying, I'm not sure who said it, rough men stand ready <clears throat> yes. to do harm to yes. those that would, would endanger the rest of us, you know? Yes. The fact yeah. that there are people who can operate at the margins and that they are, you know, when Jordan Peterson was talking about what it means to be meek, he said, meekness is 
the function of being able to do damage, having the, the capacity and the, the um, weaponry to do damage, but at the same time, the capacity to control that, keep it reined in and use it only for good. Yes. And, um, yeah. and that, that we have people at the margins who can do that for us is nothing short of a miracle, really. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a, it's, it is the natural order of things. It's a, it's a beautiful organization. And, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to be an American for just a second and say it's the beauty of capitalism and it's why capitalism works is because it, people have the opportunity to align themselves with the story in a way that suits them best. And once you've aligned yourself, you kind of give up your freedom. You don't have a choice. You know, when my boss calls me, I have to take his call. But I get a paycheck every week. I am trading some of my flexibility for some structure. And it works because I'm doing it voluntarily. I'm not compelled. I'm not forced to do a job I don't like. I have been in my past. I've had jobs I didn't like, but because of how the capitalism system works, I can improve my skills and remarket myself and find a new slot. And there's no central controlling agency that's trying to dictate that or govern that or predict my outcomes. You know, there, I'm allowed to pick. I've had 30 different job titles in my life in very different industries. And it's because it took me a while to find where I fit. But once I found it, I love it. I love my job, you know, and, and I'm very fortunate that way. But it is why capitalism works is because I could keep looking. Mm -hmm. And now I'm happy to work my job. I'm happy to spend the time. I'm happy to work on hard problems and discuss difficult things with people who don't want to hear it. It's great. I love it because I found what works for me. And, and in an environment where there's less choice and it's more centrally controlled or centrally dictated, that destroys your morale. Mm -hmm. and, and America works because it works on morale. It works on a unifying narrative and story. And I'm concerned that we're losing the narrative. That we're losing the story, you know, and it's being replaced by Marvel Comics. And that is not a proper mythology. Mm -hmm. I, I really think there needs to be a revivification of the Christian church and people reawakening to Christianity and what Christianity, the story that it's really offering, rather than the Sunday school imagery that we have from being five years old. Because that's, that is appropriate for five-year-olds it's not it doesn't have the meat that you need as an adult and i think that there's a lot of work to be done to fix that i think that's what jordan peterson started frankly well i would love to have a conversation about that sometime would that would that work for you because yeah. that it's been a big passion of mine too that this idea that i've thought for a long time that the way we do sunday school inoculates kids with these childish stories so that by the time they become adults they think oh yeah been there done that heard it don't need it yes and and they're not even interested in looking into the deeper richer beautiful truth that is in god's word i and, agree uh, and i think that would be a great conversation to have well, let's do that let's do that okay well this has been really great jeremy um I am going to remember this for a long time. Structure and flexibility is such a, it, it's such a nice package. I mean, it's a great image to look at and to hold. I like things that are simple enough to hold on to and that also have a deep enough application so that you can use that principle when you look at everything. Mm, right? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you listening and, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a closing kind of thing that ties it all together. And that's a Japanese proverb that says the arm only bends one way. And at first that just sounds like a simple trite thing to say, but it's, it, it is an encapsulation of the structure and flexibility, right? So I have, 
I have an elbow that allows my arm to bend. And if it bent two ways, I would have more flexibility, but it would be very hard to control and very hard to coordinate. And it also if I had an arm that chaos, didn't bend, right? what's that? It also results in chaos because Correct. when you have a pendulum that, that can swing both directions, that's when it creates all these chaotic yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, that's the very first illustration of chaos that people yeah is shared with people when they're being taught about chaos theory, uh -huh. the, the two, the two joint pendulum, right? Yeah. And the, the unpredictability of that. Yeah. The arm only bends one way. And, and it is, if it didn't bend at all, obviously we would be immobilized. We wouldn't be able to move, but our arm bends one way. So we have ultimate movement along half the plane, you know, along the, along the plane, but along, but only half the range. And, and because of that, our whole body can coordinate because we have these, these happening in different planes simultaneously. So we have, it balances the structure and flexibility. We have our bones, but then we have joints, but our joints only bend one way to keep them from having too much flexibility. So all of the system can adapt to working around arms only bending one way. And it's just a, that, that I have contemplated that for mm, hundreds of hours and not reached the bottom of the implications of that concept. The arm only bends one way. Mm. And that's why nature works. Nature works because the arm only bends one way, you know, and it's just, there's so much meat there. I can't, I haven't gotten to the bottom of it yet. And I've been thinking of it for 20 years. Well, it's certainly going to keep me thinking. Good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. I'm, I'm excited that these concepts are useful and helpful to you and, and that you're interested in them. It's given me a lot to think about and a lot. It helps me understand what's going on around me a lot. Um, it's, it's always been kind of a bedrock to my life, even at the times where I was most ardent atheist. It's still, it's still informed the way I looked at the world. It's that useful. Mm -hmm. Well, take care of yourself, and I'll get Thank back you. to you about our next topic. And uh, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. They're trying to revivify the church. How do we uh, repackage it, basically, for a modern audience? I'll let you get. And, back and I have some you. ideas, so it'll be good. I'll let you get What's back. That? I'll let you get back to your boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. I appreciate your time. It's been very enjoyable to chat with you, and I look forward to talking with you again soon. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye bye. All right. Thanks, Karen. See ya.